This video is brought to you by NVIDIA's industry-leading range of hardware and technology. If you want to experience cutting-edge visuals and performance in upcoming games like Mana Lords or Black Myth Wukong, check out NVIDIA's range of RTX GPUs delivering features like ray tracing, NVIDIA DLSS, NVIDIA Reflex, and so much more. Click the link below to check it out for yourself or stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Gamers, you guys all enjoying your brand new humane AI pins? I know Marcus Brownlee is. He called it the worst product he's ever reviewed. And I saw tech bros on Twitter utterly indignant that Marquez did his job and did it honestly. This one person was like, quote, I find it distasteful, almost unethical to say this when you have 18 million subscribers. Hard to explain why, but with great reach comes great responsibility. Potentially killing someone else's nascent project reeks of carelessness. First, do no harm, end quote. And it's like, my dude, the Hippocratic Oath does not apply to tech reviewers. And I'm sorry that Marquez called a shitty product shitty, but that's how it goes. The reason I found this all particularly amusing was because of how utterly broken so many of the video games sold to us are at launch, to the point where a launch like this AI pin is just standard for us at this point. Like this pin is the rough equivalent of the live service looter shooter launch we've endured a dozen times before. Overhyped, overpriced, under delivering with only the faint promise of a roadmap to cling to. Hell, there's even one line in Marquez's review where he's like, Never buy a product based on the future promise of updates. And I'm like, God damn, man, is this a tech product review or a AAA game release review? So to hear the tech world freak out over the release of one dodgy overhyped product it goes to show you that we gamers are like the frog in the water. And sadly, we were all boiled long ago. Anyway, what was the point of the story? I don't know. I just like shouting out MKBHD's content and I need a little excuse to do so, even in a video about video game news. Speaking of which, all right, let's talk about all that Star Wars Outlaws pre-order backlash. So the trailer for this dropped last week, just as I was finalizing the script for last week's show, I watched the trailer and I was like, okay, cool, looks good. I like the setting and the setup and I'm, I'm down for this, definitely. We've got a great Jedi game from Respawn. So I was excited to explore the scoundrel setting here in Outlaws. After that though, Ubisoft began providing information on how much they plan to charge for this product. And when I say they went full Ubisoft, it's sad that you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah, they absolutely went full Ubisoft. So the base game is $70, a full price release in this current generation, which sadly is just the poverty pack because heaven forbid you get the complete experience after having shelled out $70, spend another $40 and you can get four copies of Bellatro, one for you and three for your friends, delivering you and your mates dozens of hours of unique, addictive roguelike gameplay. Alternatively, you can give that money to Ubisoft. In return, they'll let you play Star Wars Outlaws three days early. They give you a season pass with absolutely no information on what that contains, as well as some cosmetics for a single player game. But wait, there's more. If you spend 130 US dollars, you can buy almost two copies of Baldur's Gate 3, one of the greatest games ever made, or nine copies of Outer Wilds, the actual greatest game ever made. Alternatively, if you are foolish enough to give that money to Ubisoft, they will give you the Star Wars game, the aforementioned three days early access, season pass and cosmetics, but also some extra cosmetics, plus a digital art book that you're never gonna look at. So all of this sucks, but unfortunately, it's very standard at this point. More and more games are selling early access to them as a pre-order, a deluxe edition bonus. Same goes for cosmetics and single player games. It's a disappointing trend that Ubisoft have helped pioneer. And at this point, they are far from the only ones doing it. Now, when it comes to game design and narratives, Ubisoft has been behind the curve for a decade or so now. But if there's one area where they've remained thoroughly avant-garde, it's their monetization. True to form, Ubisoft has found all new ways to piss us off and burn any goodwill that this impressive trailer might have garnered. The reveal that on day one, there will be exclusive missions paywalled behind the season pass pre-order. This sounds like ridiculous to even say that. So you don't know anything about this season pass at this point, by the way. For real, you don't even know that it exists yet. It could be little more than a twinkle in some Ubisoft executive's eye at this point. And yet you are being asked to pay for this absolute nothingness, handing over your cash sight unseen. And if you don't comply, Ubisoft will punish you by denying you at least one or more story missions with the most important character that you can interact with when you're telling a Star Wars scoundrel story, Jabba the Hutt. 
Now, Ubisoft did confirm that this paywalled content is not your only interaction with Jabba, but why the fuck is any of this being monetized in the first place? The backlash has been brutal, and it really takes me back to the good old days of 2018, when the great loot box war raged and Star Wars Battlefront 2 struck such a chord that the US Congress itself started to get involved. Just look at the reaction to the sequel trilogy for more on that. After EA taking a very commendable, no bullshit approach to monetization in their recent Jedi games, it's disappointing to see Ubisoft pick up where EA left off. It's like they say, always two there are, a master and an apprentice. I would love to offer some advice to Ubisoft for how to fix this mess, but it won't matter. They won't listen because they already knew how we'd react to this stuff and they did it anyway. At this point, it's on us to make informed purchase decisions. And in that context, I would remind you that Ubisoft has one of the most aggressive discounting policies of any publisher and that within a few weeks or months, this game will be like 50% off and then cheaper than that later on. So maybe that might be a better time to pick this one up if you're at all interested. Funnily enough, that wasn't the only bullshit that Ubisoft got up to this week because while they're trying to charge you more for things you don't even own yet, they're also trying to take away from you the things that you do own. I wish I was exaggerating, but I'm not. We discussed months ago that Ubisoft were planning to delist their open world racing game, The Crew, a game with a small but devoted fan base that includes the YouTuber Accursed Farms. He wasn't going to take Ubisoft shit lying down, so he began a campaign aiming to pressure governments into legislating against exactly what Ubisoft is doing here selling you a game at full price, and then taking the game away from you without offering you a full refund. His campaign is actually getting traction, and I really recommend checking out his video on the topic. Ubisoft, though, don't seem to care, because this week they started yanking people's licenses to the game on PC. This is a very unnecessary double tap, since Ubisoft had already delisted the game and turned the servers off. A move like this seems almost cruel, and we can only guess why Ubisoft would take a step like this, given that ownership licenses are almost never revoked for inactive games. The games typically just sit dormant and unplayable in your digital libraries. Hopefully Accursed Farms campaign finds success because game cancellations and delistings are all too common and only getting more common, so we need a permanent legislated solution. Speaking of delisting games, did you guys hear that Lawbreakers is coming back? For real, no bullshit, it's back and it's playable right now. You know how I know? Because Cliffy B himself was tweeting about it. It is, for the moment at least, an unofficial fan project that somehow makes the game playable despite it being delisted back in 2018. Important to note that the developer, Boss Key Productions, was shuttered years ago and Cliffy B does not own the rights to Lawbreakers. They are held by Nexon, who have made it clear that they have no intention to revive this IP. We know that because Cliffy B has been publicly begging Nexon to do something with it for years now and they haven't so much as liked a tweet. Lawbreakers was a great game that was undone in no small part by its horrifically bad marketing campaign, a campaign that Cliffy B himself spearheaded, and he was not a good ambassador for his product. The game tried to present as being for the ultra hardcore arena shooter enthusiasts, forgetting the fact that that genre had died nearly two decades prior, so there weren't many of those folks still around to market to. The result was one of the first live service launch catastrophes of its type, one that would go on to serve as a template for myriad other live service launches that failed to capture a player base before being unceremoniously delisted. Still, unlike many of the other live service flops, Lawbreakers was actually good. So it's nice to see it back in some form. I hope it continues to grow in popularity because it genuinely deserves to do so. One more piece of delisting news, Airship Syndicate, makers of the recently released Wayfinders, have delisted the game just months after launch, but, and this is an important but, they're doing it so they can bring the game back online in future after they rework it. Wayfinder was slash is a third person fantasy role playing looter, not unlike Warframe. And that was one of the many reasons that Warframe developer Digital Extreme agreed to publish the title. Sadly though, the launch was an absolute disaster with the game being basically unplayable for days and tons of bugs ruining the experience. It was so bad that the player count immediately created and never recovered, which prompted Digital Extreme to jettison the game from their portfolio while at the same time closing down their entire a publishing operation. Airship Syndicate remained undeterred though, vowing to continue work on the title, and now it seems as though they have bolder ambition than just minor fixes. They say that delisting it allows them to overhaul the game in a way that's quote, consistent with our standard and beliefs, end quote. Bit of a cryptic statement, but they do specify that they're looking to adopt a new business model, so don't expect this one to be free to play when it comes back online. Those who bought the game already can still play it, by the way, but everybody else is locked out for now. I'll be sure to let you know when that title has been relisted. And speaking of relisting, Chinese players rejoice because that terrifying era of going outside and living an actual life, that is over. 
NetEase and Blizzard have patched up their messy, messy divorce, and as a result, Blizzard titles including World of Warcraft are back on the menu. The previous partnership ran for 14 years before the two entities couldn't come to terms, resulting in much outrage on the part of Chinese players no longer able to access accounts they'd poured thousands of hours of their life into. It got so bad that people were destroying a giant gore house sculpture that sat outside NetEase's office. That's messed up, man, but also kind of metal. I'm pretty torn on this one, not gonna lie. Either way, the new deal is between NetEase and Microsoft, and it should come into effect pretty soon. Microsoft's shareholders surely very happy to see them regain access to the lucrative Chinese market. All right, here comes some super disappointing news. We ain't getting that Dead Space 2 remake we were hoping and praying for. I mean, to be fair, we should have seen it coming from a mile away because if there's one thing that EA does best, it's ruin our hopes and dreams when it comes to Dead Space. The remake felt like a rare gift, a game so brilliantly constructed and so free of bullshit that we were just waiting for one of the monkey paw fingers to curl. Sure, Sure enough, the title, apparently, did not sell to EA satisfaction, and as a result, the planned Dead Space 2 remake has been cancelled. Now, this story actually got a little complicated because initial reporting from Jeff Grubb was that Dead Space 2 was in the concepting and pre-production phase and that EA then cancelled it. EA then put out a curious statement on the matter saying, quote, We don't normally comment on rumors, but there is no validity to this story, end quote. Grubb publicly pushed back on that, saying you really shouldn't take these sort of corporate rebuffs at face value. And sure enough, further clarification came from Jason Schreier of Bloomberg. He says that what existed wasn't Dead Space 2 per se, but rather a Dead Space project that considered a number of potential ideas, including a Dead Space remake, or potentially a whole new entry in the series. So Grubb was basically right, and the bottom line is that Dead Space is, once again, dead. And that is a real shame, because survival horror games are cool, and Dead Space games are cool, and there's a market for them, and it really sucks that EA chose to just abandon this franchise, rather than find some creative solution that would have kept it alive. On that note, some very sad news about Ascendant Studios, makers of Immortals of Avium. As has been well documented, Immortals of Avium bombed bigly. It wasn't a great title, but it wasn't a total catastrophe either. It was just a pretty basic ass 7 out of 10 experience in a year where we barely had enough time or money to play all of the 10 out of 10 experiences that were dropping. As a result, Ascendant announced some months ago that they were laying off a significant portion of their staff, but vowed to struggle on with the studio boss saying that he was excited about their next project. It seems though that the tide has turned against them, as this week it's been reported that the studio has furloughed the majority of its staff, a fancy word that basically means that the jobs still exist, but no one's getting paid. You have to assume that the studio is scrambling for funding, but in this very tough funding environment and a track record that doesn't position them particularly well, it is likely that Ascendant are facing a very tough uphill battle. Still, I hope they prevail because I think Immortals of Avium had a lot going for it and that team definitely deserves another shot. A quick lightning round to finish off. The annual BAFTA awards happened last week and wouldn't you know it, Baldur's Gate 3 won some awards. It won Best Music, the Player's Choice Awards. Andrew Wincott also won the award for Best Supporting Role for his portrayal of Raphael. And can I just say that that is such a great pick because for all the deserved recognition that the rest of the voice cast got, I don't think any other character ate scenes up as gluttonously as Raphael did. What a performance from Wincott. Outside of that, Baldur's Gate 3 also won the BAFTA for Game of the Year, making Baldur's Gate 3 the very first game in history to win every major Game of the Year award. Truly unbelievable and absolutely well-deserved. Other winners on the night included Alan Wake 2 for Artistic Achievement and Audio Achievement, Super Mario Bros. Wonder for Family Game and Multiplayer Game, Cyberpunk won Best Evolving Game, I'm not sure it should be eligible for that category, but okay, and Tears of the Kingdom won for Technical Achievement. You can see the full winners list on the BAFTA website. Congrats to all winners, and I'm actually really looking forward to this year's award season since it'll allow us to finally answer the question, can a DLC win Game of the Year? If Miyazaki has anything to say about it, the answer is probably yes. A bunch of Destiny developer veterans have left Bungie to set up their own studio. The group includes people like Chris Ofdal, a former creative director, as well as senior design leads Raylene Deck and Grant McKay. The studio is called Hidden Grove and it's working on a quote, multiplayer competitive adventure game, end quote, which is being built in Unreal Engine 5. Looks like the game is shooting for something in the general vicinity of a battle royale, at least according to Ofdal, quote, we think there is an opportunity for something new and different than a battle royale by pushing even further into the adventure adventurous territory, which has opened up additional options for new types of teamwork and competition." End quote. They're planning on doing some closed testing mid-year, so we may hear something more towards the back end of this year or 2025. Gearbox Publishing has rebranded to Arc Games. Embracer Group recently sold Gearbox to 2K Games, taking some, but not all, of its publishing operations in that transaction. What was left behind is holding on to the publishing rights of games like Remnant 2, Risk of Rain, and Hyperlight Breaker, 
all great franchises that have a lot of life left in them, so let's hope that Embracer give this publisher and these studios what they need to thrive. Given Embracer's track record though, I am very concerned about the future of these franchises. A quick update on social horror game content warning, it continues to sell absolutely gangbusters. They gave away over 6 million copies of the game on April 1st, but since then they have been selling it and people have been buying it. And over the weekend, the developer announced that over 1 million copies have been sold with no signs of that slowing down anytime soon. Congrats to the team for that one. Always nice to see that sort of success story. Here's something weird and very unexpected. The Hollywood rush to adapt video games has crossed over into the indie space with the announcement this past week that indie darling Dredge will be getting a movie adaptation. It's from Production House Story Kitchen, founded by the Sonic movie film producer, Dimitri Johnson. Story Kitchen has some other projects on the boiler, including an animated Tomb Raider show, a Streets of Rage movie, something based on It Takes Two, and even something adapting Toe Jam and Earl. Even with all that on the list, Dredge still feels like the weirdest, most outside pick, but you know what? I'm into it. Dredge was cool, and I can see it having a lot of appeal to even those who've never heard of the game, which to be honest is probably going to be most people. Speaking of adaptations, the Fallout TV show has absolutely crushed it, following in the traditions of The Last of Us, Cyberpunk Edge Runners, League of Legends Arcane, and of course, the exquisite Halo TV show. Fallout on Amazon Prime is an example of how to get video game adaptations right. And yes, I was absolutely joking about the Halo thing. Don't worry, I'm with you. Fallout debuted at 94% with critics on Rotten Tomatoes and is almost as popular with audiences, sitting at an 88%. I feel like that number is soft though, because everyone I've spoken to really loved it, and I watched the first episode and I really enjoyed it, but to be honest, I'm a pretty easy mark for anything with Walton Goggins in it. The show has been so successful that it's resulted in a huge spike in player activity across all Fallout games. On Steam, Fallout 1's player count rose 500%, Fallout 3 rose 400%, Fallout 4 and New Vegas both rose 200%, and 76 hit a new concurrent player count record of 39,000 people. It continues to be ridiculous that we need to wait another 10 years before Bethesda are going to make a new Fallout game since they're delivering the Elder Scrolls game first, and that's not even in full production yet. Microsoft has a vast stable of studios it could use to do great things with this franchise. Let's hope Phil Spencer gives one of them a shot sooner rather than later. And finally, did you hear former Blizzard president Mike Ibarra's latest suggestion on Twitter? Tipping 10 or $20 after you finished a $70 game that you really enjoyed. Quote, when I beat a game, there are some that just leave me in awe of how amazing that experience was. At the end of the game, I've often thought, I wish I could give these folks another 10 or $20 because it was worth more than my initial 70 and they didn't try to nickel and dime me every second. Games like Horizon Zero Dawn, God of War, Red Dead Redemption 2, Baldur's Gate 3, Elden Ring, etc. I know $70 is already a lot, but it's an option at the end of the game I wish I had at times. Some games are just that special, end quote. And you know what? I kind of get it. And it's not a bad idea. But there's just one problem, Mike Ybarra, former president of Blizzard Entertainment. You think for a single fucking second that that tip jar is actually going to end up in the bank accounts of the people that made the game rather than the executives who did their level best to fuck it up? Come on, my dude, you are not that naive, which makes this suggestion very, very strange. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, that I initiative showcase happened. It was just 40 minutes of back-to-back -back game reveals and announcements, just the way we like it. A lot of it was updates for existing games or 1.0 announcements for games in early access or console port announcements, but there were some genuine, honest-to-goodness world premieres, like the big one. Slay the Spy 2 has officially been revealed again. I say again, because the developer had to low-key reveal it on Twitter when all that Unity shit blew up before. They wanted to put Unity on blast by announcing a change of the game engine, and they actually followed through with that. They binned years of work in Unity to completely rebuild their game in Godot, and good on them, because that Unity stuff was some serious bullshit. All of that aside, all we got here was an animated reveal trailer and a release window announcement. Slay the Spy will arrive sometime in 2025. Speaking of cinematic non-gameplay reveals, we don't really like them, but sometimes they do manage to capture a vibe that's at least a little bit enticing. And I think the reveal trailer for RKGK did just that. It's got a little bit of that Jet Set Radio energy fused with a neon cyberpunk flair. It's from Gearbox, which I guess is Arc Publishing now, and it's arriving sometime mid this year. Vampire Survivors began its life as a game shamelessly riffing on that Castlevania aesthetic, and things are coming full circle now, sort of, as they just announced a crossover with another Konami property, Contra. Honestly, this looks absolutely sick. 
and the perfect evolution of the survivor's formula. And yeah, whoever came up with this deserves a massive raise. It's called Operation Guns, because of course it is, and it's out on May 9th. Funnily enough, there is actually a Castlevania crossover happening with a different game, V Rising announced a partnership with Konami a few weeks back, but during the showcase they revealed gameplay and it looks pretty cool, not gonna lie. I've seen far worse crossovers in my time. This is additional paid DLC that arrives the same time as V Rising hits 1.0, which is on May 8th. Mouse was one that I profiled in my Put This On Your Radar segment a while back. It's basically like Steamboat Willy if it was a first person shooter and just looks extremely stylish, extremely cool. The trailer was our first look at proper gameplay in actual levels and it confirmed a release window of some time in 2025. The award-winning Never Alone is getting a sequel in Never Alone 2. That was revealed during the showcase. It'll be co-op this time which is a nice upgrade, no date for that one. Cataclysmo is a really striking looking tower defense game that also got a reveal. This is from the team behind Moonlighter and Mage Seeker, so it's no wonder it looks this good. It's arriving 16th of July, exclusive to PC. Biggest surprise of the whole showcase though has got to be the Rogue Prince of Persia. Who'd have thought we'd go from getting zero Prince of Persia games for like a decade to getting two of them inside of six months? That's exactly what's happening. This one is also 2D, but it's not a Metroidvania this time. Instead, it's a roguelike, hence the title. And it's in very good hands because it's being developed by Evil Twin, the studio that was formed to provide long-term ongoing support to Dead Cells. They've wrapped up support on Dead Cells, and I guess this is why. The art style is totally unique in a love it or hate it kind of way, but I'm into it. I also like how leveraged it is into platforming since that's a great throwback to the original. The game's met a very mixed reception, but so did The Lost Crown, and that went on to win hearts and minds across the board. Given Evil Twin's pedigree, I expect they'll do the same thing here when the Rogue Prince of Persia launches into early access on May 14th. By the way, this wasn't actually that big a surprise to us because we got an early heads up that this game exists and Edmund actually got to play it. We couldn't do a video on it because the hands-on time was really limited, but Edmund did do a brief write-up of his impressions over on the Patreon. You'll find a link to that below the like button. Okay, so that was the I initiative showcase, but there were plenty of other announcements this week, like Ultimate Swing Golf, a new golf game from the people who made everybody's golf and Hot Shots Golf back in the day. The only downside with Ultimate Swing is that it is a VR title and it's exclusive to Meta headsets. So that's that. It's out on May 16th. Pac-Man Chomp Champs is like Pac-Man Battle Royale. This one was a Stadia exclusive, but with the death of that service, Bandai decided to port this one over to every other platform. It arrives on May 9th. Classic World of Warcraft. It feels as though the journey is coming to an end again. I mean, for my money, well, it kind of ended with Wrath of the Lich King, but many of us still held on until Cataclysm, which is when it felt like things really started to go downhill fast. Though to be fair, Firelands Rag was a genuine all-timer. That was, that was, that was special. Regardless, Blizzard have now confirmed a release date for the Counter expansion. It'll arrive on May 20th. And finally, if the success of the Fallout TV show has got you hankering to play the game, well, Bethesda saw you coming a mile off because this week they just announced a next-gen update for Fallout 4. It's a free update for PS5 and Xbox Series consoles, and it delivers both a quality graphics mode prioritizing resolution and a performance mode promising up to 60 FPS. And given that this is a Bethesda Game Studios game, I am sure you can expect a rock solid 25 FPS that spikes to 60 FPS during in-game menus and loading screens. The update also benefits PC players, sort of? Delivering ultra-wide support and Steam Deck verification. The only downside? All of your mods are broken again. Thanks Bethesda. We'll come back to that topic a little later in the episode. So what came out last week? Well, gigantic Rampage Edition dropped for all platforms bar the Switch. This is the revival of the Motiga-made free-to-play MOBA, now developed by Abstraction Games and published by Arc Games, formerly Gearbox Publishing. I was really rooting for this one, and it seems to have come through largely, though there are definitely some teething issues to work through. It's sitting at a mostly positive 73% on Steam with over 2,500 reviews counted. It hit a peak play count of around 6,000 people as well, which isn't too bad given this is a pretty niche release without too much buzz behind it. No reviews out for it yet, but PC Gamer did have some impressions and they weren't great. Quote, I've relished the chance to revisit a game I thought I'd never get to play again, and that feeling drowns out the frustrations I felt wading through glitches and lag spikes. I don't sense some impending comeback by which Gigantic overpowers its competition. After all, they've thrived in the half decade Gigantic has been absent, but it's officially playable again, and that's a huge win for the game's small, enduring community." End quote. Let's hope those issues get fixed up quickly because yeah, the odds are definitely stacked against this one and it doesn't need any more headwind. Speaking of headwinds, Broken Roads. Oh man, these are less headwinds and more hurricane gales as Broken Roads has barely flopped off the starting blocks after its early false start that saw it recall review code due to glaring issues that took months to fix. 
game seems to be in a much better state at this point, technically speaking, but reviews are almost all universally bleak, painting a picture of a game that is totally unable to deliver on the promise of its setting, its narrative setups, or its gameplay systems. IGN scored it a brutal 4 out of 10 and said, quote, Broken Roads is an ambitious RPG that can't meet the expectations it sets for itself. It asks you to invest in an intricate morality system only to not end up making good use of it, giving you choices that don't lead to much. A lot of this could be forgiven if the story held up, but there really isn't much of a story to begin with, despite the philosophical angle Broken Roads tries hard to get across. Couple this disappointing journey's interesting but poorly executed ideas with pointless and often busted combat, and Broken Roads lives up to its name in all the wrong ways." End quote. Australian-based publication Well Played were on a similar page, scoring it a 5 out of 10 and saying, quote, "...a clear visual identity can't mask the game's incurious role-playing and slightly clumsy combat loop. It goes beyond the fundamental broken experience I had in the review window. Even under the best circumstances, Broken Road struggles to have its rubber meet the pavement." End quote. The developer has outlined a roadmap promising various fixes and improvements, but it does seem like a very long road ahead for Broken Roads. Other release I was looking forward to this week was Harold Halibut, the stop-motion claymation narrative game that had plenty of buzz behind it in the lead-up to launch. It seems to be pretty good. Not incredible, but solid enough. It's sitting at a 73 on Open Critic, with most reviews recognizing it for its unique visual style and the earnestness of its narrative and characters, while also saying that Harold Halibut is often just a little bit boring. Kotaku didn't score it, but they were positive about it, saying, quote, I can imagine that some people will bounce off Harold Halibut. They might be put off by how long and repetitive it is or unable to gel with the character designs. They might not be as charmed by it as I was. I would not begrudge them. But to me, this game is precious, beautiful, deeply impressive, and worth the monumental effort that must have gone into making it." End quote. Austin actually played this as well. We didn't do a video for it, but he did do a write-up on the Patreon, free to wall, link below the like button. Austin was not much of a fan of this one. He's not recommending it, and he says, quote, "...perhaps those in the right headspace might appreciate its easygoing format, but Harold Halibut struggled to hold my attention. Its complete lack of engaging gameplay elements results in a vapid experience that could have benefited from a more condensed runtime or more involved puzzles. It's not bad, it's just rather boring, which while perfectly reflective of Harold's character, doesn't make for a particularly enjoyable video game." End quote. Like I said, if you want to read the full write-up, link below the like button. So what's coming out this week? Well, we've got some real honest-to-goodness stuff this week, like the next DLC for Final Fantasy 16, titled The Rising Tide. This one delivers a new location, a new companion to fight alongside, a new icon to command, and those fucked up tonberries we spotted in the trailer. This is of course exclusive to PS5 and it launches today. Here's what I'm very excited about actually. Moon Studios, makers of the Ori games, decided to change tack with their latest release. It isn't a dreamy Metroidvania 2D platformer, but rather a top-down open-world action Souls-like. The art design on display is incredible, and the hands-on previews for this have all been universally glowing. This is actually an early access release, which arrives today exclusive to PC, but you have to assume it'll arrive on consoles as well when it hits 1.0. Very excited to get stuck into this one. It feels like a million years ago that this was announced, but finally, this week, coming on 23rd of April, Euden Chronicles 100 Heroes will launch for all platforms. This is a very special game for a number of reasons. First and foremost, it's the spiritual successor to Suikoden, one of the most celebrated JRPGs of all time. It's a project conceived and delivered by a number of the people who worked on the original Suikoden, including the late, great Yoshitaka Muriyama, who sadly passed away before seeing Euden released. That makes this a bittersweet moment in the history of this great and story franchise, but it's wonderful to know that his work continues to mean so much to so many people all these years later. Like I said, 23rd of April, all platforms. Tales of Kenzera Zao was revealed to us at the Game Awards last year. It's from Abu Bakar Salim, the voice of Bayek from Assassin's Creed Origins. He's also starring in the upcoming season of House of Dragons. In his spare time, he started a game studio called Surgeon, and his debut title is being published under EA's Origins label, which looks to fund smaller projects and indie-style games. I played the demo for this one during a recent Steam Next Fest and really enjoyed it. It's a very competent Metroidvania with some slick visuals and some fantastic voice talent. If you like the recent Prince of Persia game, there's a very good chance you'll enjoy this one too. It arrives on the 23rd for all platforms. And finally, Boomer Shooter fans, here comes another one. Phantom Fury is the sequel to the much-loved Ion Fury released back in 2019, and a prequel to the less-loved Bombshell, which arrived in 2016. That was a 3D first-person shooter, but the series finally found its groove when it reverted to the retro-inspired Boomer Shooter aesthetic. Phantom Fury is less build engine and more unreal 
Unreal Engine, but it's still adopting a visual style that harkens back to the Quake Engine days. This looks extremely sick, and given the track record of 3D Realms lately, there's every reason to be optimistic. It launches 24th of April for all platforms. All right, remember how I said that the Fallout 4 update broke everyone's mods? Well, that sucks for us, but it sucks way more for these guys. So put this on your radar. London, 2237. They always said the sun had never set on the Empire. But now, most of old Blighty is a shell of his former self. Bodged together buildings, radiation-filled nightmares, hooligans, up for a bit of argy-bargy. This is Fallout London, a Fallout 4 mod so ambitious and so massive that mod site Nexus Mods literally could not host it. Luckily, City Project Red owned good old games stepped up, offering to host the mod in a way that still makes it playable if you're using Steam or even Epic Games, since Fallout 4 is about to arrive there too. As for what this mod is, it's Fallout in London. A dedicated team of enthusiast developers have been working on this since 2019, and they've been aiming to deliver a map the same size as Boston in Fallout 4. It's a fully written, narrative-led campaign with voice talent from the likes of Neil Newborn, voice of Astarian from Baldur's Gate 3. Fallout London is, for all intents and purposes, is the closest thing we're going to get to Fallout 5 for like, I don't know, a decade since Bethesda are going to be all tied up with the Elder Scrolls for a long, long time. This mod was meant to release this week, but Bethesda did not let this team know that a massive update to Fallout 4 was on the way. So this team found out when we did, and since then they've had to delay the mod's release indefinitely so they can assess the scale of the changes and the necessary rework on their end. Would have been nice for Bethesda to give them a bit of a heads up, but hey, what are you going to do? Anyway, I just wanted to shout this one out since this team has had a very rough week and I wanted to do what little I could to help get some eyeballs on their project. Mods like this always amaze me since the time, effort and dedication that goes into them is remarkable and it's a fascinating corner of gaming that makes this art form so unique. Long may it continue. Good luck to the team. Looking forward to playing it when it eventually gets released. Sort of free stuff time now and not a lot to shout out this week. Epic right now are still giving away Ghost Runner, so be sure to grab that. Later this week, it'll be replaced by The Big Con, a comedic narrative adventure game sitting at overwhelmingly positive on Steam. So it seems like it made more than a few people chuckle. There's also Town of Salem 2, which is a casual online competitive strategy game that asks, what if Among Us was set in old America? This is actually already free to play over on Steam, but hey, now it's free on the Epic Game Store as well. Amazon is riding that four Fallout hype train all the way to Megaton. They are already giving away Fallout Tactics and Fallout 76, but soon they'll be giving away Fallout 3 Game of the Year Edition and Fallout New Vegas. The only downside being that in order to play them, you need to do so on Amazon Luna, Amazon's ailing cloud gaming streaming service that absolutely no one talks about and no one knows exists. It's only available in select territories, but if you're on the list, then enjoy yourself. I wonder if New Vegas crashes in the cloud as often as it crashes on local hardware. Truly the ultimate test for Amazon's infrastructure. A feel-good story isn't a funny one, but it's a genuine feel-good one, and these are often my favorites. Larrigan is in the headlines a lot these days. That tends to happen when you release one of the greatest games of all time, the first game to win every single major Game of the Year award, VG3 sweep, as they say unironically. They're also very out there about their views on the industry, regularly making headlines for their sizzling hot takes such as, maybe don't fire all of your staff if you don't have to. And my personal favorite, Larry and asking AAA publishers, have you tried just making good games? But they say the true test of character is what you do when no one is looking. And sure enough, Larry and aren't just putting on a show for the cameras, they're walking their talk without needing to pat themselves on the back. Case in point, this week, the lead level designer for Blasphemous took to Twitter to reveal that Larian Studios was one of the game's biggest funders on Kickstarter. Quote, they dropped a four-figure sum, never asked for their rewards, and just kept making one of the best games ever done in recent years. Legends, end quote. That is pretty rad. That is Larian putting their money where their mouth is, helping smaller games to succeed while asking for nothing in return. I mean, they could have made a bigger investment and asked for a cut of the profits or whatever, but they didn't. They just dropped a bunch of cash and rode off into the sunset. That is cool. And I think it's the perfect example of why Larian are as loved as they are and why they're such an important presence in this industry. All right, well, that's the show. So thank you very much for tuning in. Like I mentioned, if you want to see that Harold Halibut review or the Prince of Persia preview, you'll find them on the Patreon, freely accessible to all. So go and check them out. This week, I'm working on a review for a game that I'm not allowed to talk about yet, but I am excited about it. Expect that to drop next week. The podcast is going up this weekend. We're going to do a big deep dive into the Fallout TV show. I'm also going to be checking out No Rest for the Wicked because that looks fantastic. 
sick, and I'm very in the mood for that type of game right now. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to drop it a like, as that is always super helpful in YouTube land. And don't forget to subscribe and ding the notification bell if you'd like to come back for more. Thank you for watching, and a big thanks to this week's sponsor, NVIDIA. We're all very used to games getting content updates at this point, but one thing you might miss is how often games are getting graphical and performance updates from developers making use of technology provided by this video's sponsor, NVIDIA. For example, Tribes 3 Rivals is bringing Tribes back after more than a decade on ice. That game launched into early access a few weeks ago and it's been getting great reviews. Just recently though, the developer announced that the game would support NVIDIA DLSS 2 and DLLA, with DLSS 2 substantially improving frame rates and DLAA using AI to deliver sharp image fidelity. The Outlast Trials is another one that just released into 1.0 and it's sitting at 91% very positive on Steam. When it went into 1.0, it added support for Nvidia DLSS 2, meaning that lower end machines can run this more easily and higher end machines can crank up other graphical settings without dropping frames. And that's just the stuff that's already out when Nvidia are often working with the makers of some of the biggest, most anticipated games to ensure that Nvidia's cutting edge tech is available on day one. Take Black Myth Wukong, for example, when that launches later this year, it'll support DLSS 3.5. This is all new technology that results in better image reconstruction when using DLSS. That means that when you enable DLSS, finer details like foliage will look even better than ever before. There's also Star Wars Outlaws, which just got a cinematic story trailer. And just prior to that, the developers confirmed that it would support not only DLSS 3, but also ray trace effects at launch. Effects including RTX direct illumination, ray trace reflections, and ray trace global illumination. These are some of the most impactful lighting and reflections options you can add to a game and they always significantly transform any game that supports them. One outside pick you may want to keep your eye on is Mana Lords. It's not that outside I guess since it currently is the most wishlisted game on Steam and it just had a preview round with plenty of positive buzz. It's out at the end of the month and it's a pretty demanding game as many of these medieval real-time strategy games are but thankfully it's shipping with Nvidia DLSS 2 on day one delivering a significant performance uplift to guarantee you better frame rates and flexibility to turn on other graphical settings. See that's what's important to understand about NVIDIA GPUs. You're not just getting a piece of hardware that renders visuals. You're getting that for sure, but you're also getting access to an entire ecosystem of graphical and performance technology that improves things like frame rates, lighting, input latency, the way your monitor interacts with your GPU, and so much more. GPUs are more than just the hardware in your PC at this point. And when it comes to all of this technology, NVIDIA is miles ahead of anyone else in the market, and they're not slowing down as they're constantly developing new technologies and applying it to more and more games. If you'd like to learn more about all of this, I'll leave a link to NVIDIA's site below. Thanks NVIDIA for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it.